15 years um, looking after agriculture across those businesses. And um, he is going to talk a little bit about low input sheep uh, and uh, hopefully touch on Samfoin, one of uh, the great crops at Dalesford. Over to you, Richard. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Uh, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the business that I run and that we've developed so that you understand a bit about how I came to some of the conclusions that I did. Um, we have farm organically, we farm just sort of 6,000 acres, 3,000 acres in the Cotswolds and 3,000 acres up in Staffordshire. I head up agriculture for JCB Farms and Dalesford Organic, which of course are all owned by the Bamford family. Fifteen years ago I was challenged by the Bamford family to create a sustainable farming system that we could be proud of, where we produced a premium quality product which we could then market and sell through our own shops. On a weekly basis now I would process through our own abattoir something like 17 to 20 tonnes of meat a week. It's all done 100% organically and the vast majority of it comes from our own farms. I'm here specifically to talk about sheep, and I'm great at diversing into other subjects as we go along, but I'll try and stick to the, to the sheep process. So our main commercial flock is a thin ewe, and I want to tell you why I came to the decision to farm thlins, because the breed of sheep and the genetics you contain within them go an awful long way to a sustainable low input system. My mother's side of the family farm up in Northumberland and they're disgusted with me that I don't look at North Country mules anymore as the uh, you that produces our fat lambs. But the actual fact is, is that a thlin is uh, a smaller sheep than a ewe. She takes less uh, maintenance, she takes, she's a lower cost you to feed, um, she produces 100% of the lamb of a mule and uh, the great advantage is of course farming organically I was able to close the flock and produce our own replacements. We lamb in April from the 1st of April onwards and we lamb just over 4,000 ewes um, producing 7,200 lambs. I produce my own replacements and that leaves me with about 6,500 lambs to process through our own abattoir. One of my great challenges is being able to produce 150 lambs a week a year round rather than producing them in the spring and having them all gone by the autumn. I need to be rotating sheep around various crops to have that 150 lambs of between 18 and 22 kilogram carcass weight of an R3L carcass, which is the perfect butcher's lamb for our butcher's shops. Um, we have developed our flock over the last 15 years. So I started the flock with a foundation flock. They're very heavily recorded. So all the sheep are entered into an EID system and at any stage in the year we can blackball any one of those 4,000 ewes. When I say blackball them, it just means that I'm not going to breed a female from them to come into the flock. So about 1,700 a year are actually blackballed electronically and in the autumn they're automatically drafted out uh, of the flock and they are then tucked with a different terminal sire. So their lambs obviously all come in as meat lambs and then your premier producing ewes are producing your potential um, female replacements to come into uh, the flock as well. Not only the maternal lines do we produce but also the paternal lines. So we have 200... Um, highly recorded pedigree performance use and it's from those 200 that I produce the paternal lines. So I have ownership of these genetics. Now within any breed of sheep <coughs> in numbers there will be different uh, standards and types of breed. So Flins on my farm will be a little bit different to Flins to the guy next door or at the other end of the country. Flins were originally developed on the Thlin Peninsula in at North Wales and they were a very different sheep when they were developed. Now low input systems. We farm 6,000 acres organically and one of the most surprising things that farmers see when they visit our farms is the lack of weeds. And so I've become very passionate about Tidy Farm um, and also about the breeding of this flock that perform well within it. 
I would fatten the vast majority of our lambs, so we lamb from the 1st of April and not really looking to produce a fat lamb from that new season until the end of August, mid-August at the earliest, and the bulk of them coming on from around the first week in September. Our arable rotation goes around in a very simple rotation, and following on from Simon's talk just there, talking about min till and the ploughing of ground in my system the moldboard plough is very important we would use a moldboard plough in about one in six years so the simple rotation would be three years red clover lay for fertility building a legumous plant now red clover is a very very good weed suppressant we would establish our red clover around the last week in august or the first week in september you can very successfully grow it by blowing seed into the top of a cereal crop about six weeks before harvest. You would harvest, take the straw off and think, well, I haven't had a very good germination here. But then after a fortnight with a little bit of moisture, and that could just be heavy dew at that time of the year, you get this massive uptake and it will grow and you'll have a beautiful sward by the end of September, early October. And I can instantly move lambs onto that to start finishing them. We tend to combine, take the straw off, because the straw's a real premium for us and we need it. I'll then just scuffle the top very lightly, broadcast red clover seed on, roll it in very tightly, and by mid-October I'm grazing lambs uh, on it. Now to give you an idea of the amount of lamb that we can produce from a certain area, I can think of one block at home that's been into a red clover lay for the last three years and that totals 170 acres and I would fatten between mid-September and Christmas around 1200 lambs. That red clover lay um, will get those lambs performing at about 300 grams a day live weight gain which is pretty impressive considering they're having no uh, added protein at all to their diet. You have to be very careful with red clover because it is very high in oestrogen, so you would avoid feeding, breeding females six weeks either side of tupping on red clover. It is very high in oestrogen, you read about these things, but I can tell you that if you put females onto red clover in the autumn for fattening lambs, they'll instantly grow udders. So it is, it is very high in oestrogen and it will upset the reproductive cycle of your female. So the other great advantage of red clover is, is that you can treat it very badly. So in a wet autumn or a wet early winter, you can think, goodness me, I've ruined that and, and really pummeled it. But actually it recovers very, very well. Um, uh, and, and so I abuse it uh, terribly. But for fattening lambs, absolutely wonderful. So farmers will come. Then they will say to me, actually... I'd be terrified of doing that because I'd be frightened that all these lambs were going to get bloat and die and roll over. So the way I avoid that, and I've learned over the last 20 years, and I've probably fattened something like 30,000 fat lambs on red clover, and very, very rarely, if any, ever, can I remember losing a lamb uh, to bloat. I incorporate a little bit of ryegrass into the lay. So it's incorporated at about 10, the red clover goes on at about 10 to 12 kilograms a hectare. And then I'll put ryegrass into the lay of about another 12 kilograms a hectare. And what you'll find is, is when you turn your lambs onto it, the lamb will find the red clover less palatable than the ryegrass. So they'll nibble across the field and eat the ryegrass. Then they'll start making their way back across it, all the time taking in a little bit of red clover as they go. And so you've introduced that crop to them at a very gradual rate. <coughs> uh, and then they'll get onto the red clover and then they really start performing. So because I'm looking for that 150, 175 lambs a week, I will put batches of lambs of five, six, seven hundred onto a red clover lay and then take them off and know full well that they're going to perform at about that 300 grams a day, which is a very efficient um, way of feeding lambs. The other crop that I've got very interested in over the last five or six years is sanfoin. Now, I run a business which is marketed heavily. We have four shops in London. Um, and we have a £35 million turnover business now in the brand that is Dalesford. I started to read about Sanfoin and discovered that Sanfoin covered 25% of the Cotswolds 100 years ago, and it was found then that Sanfoin was the ultimate horsey, and it took 25% of your landmass to grow the energy to feed 
your horses to work your farm. So I thought, well, Sanfoin's got to be a pretty good crop to have a go at again. Um, and so I grew a small five-acre plot. Now, I'm not a scientist, and I, I, I can only talk to you about my experience. My red clover lay, the other great advantage is, is that I can take two silage cuts from it. And in the first cut around the end of May, early June, I'll reckon on taking about 10 tonnes of fresh weight silage after a 24-hour wilt. Six weeks later, when I analyse it as a feed, it will come in at about 14% protein with an ME, that's the one that I look at, metabolizable energy, how much energy can the animal extract from it. And it'll have a score of about 10, 10 and a half. 10 is pretty average, 10 and a half is good, 11 is excellent. When I harvest the sanfoin, a pure stand of sanfoin, it will yield about 15 tonnes per acre, or 37.5 a hectare. Um, Analyse it six weeks later, it'll have a protein content of around 18% and an ME that's off the scale. So I also uh, have a dairy farm, and so I now have control groups of cows that are just eating sanfoin, and the uptake and the palatability and the feed value of it has been fantastic. Where you have to be careful with sanfoin is that it is a crown-grown plant and last year during that terrible drought we were desperate for tucker in the autumn to flush the ewes uh, and so we rather heavily grazed and overgrazed the sanfoin. Once you've chewed that crown out it is um, gone forever and so you've damaged the plant. The great advantage of it is that it can be a very successful seven or eight year lay. So we establish it in warm soils. The establishment of sanfoin is the hardest bit. So you put it into warm soils in about mid-May. So we'll tend to uh, create a seedbed, following the previous speaker. Um, I have to say that we do need a nice till to, uh, to put our seed into. Roll it in really tightly. And then the following day, put on top of it about 10 kilograms to the hectare of timothy and fescue. Now that'll just appear and keep the weeds at bay because the samphoin is slow uh, to establish itself. And often in the first year I'll think, well this has been a waste of time and I'm not getting on very well with this. But in the second year it'll really come into its own. Some years if we get moisture in the summer I can take a, a, a silage or haylage crop off it in the autumn. And just to keep it tidy, if I didn't, I would top it anyway. Um, but the following year, you'll find that the sanfoin has really established itself and it will drown out everything else. And so you get your sea of pink flowers around sort of the end of May time. And about mid-flowering is when I'd mow it for silage. And you'll get this real bulk um, because that, of course, is a premium. You're farming organically. I'm looking for bulk uh, feed to, to put into our farm storage. Um, so the second year is the way forward and moisture is important but top it in the autumn to keep it clean. One of the other questions that I'm asked is, is how do we manage to keep our grass lays and clover lays so clean? I like to establish it as I said last week in August, first week in September. If it became dirty, if weeds appeared that I didn't want to be there, then I would top it. I would go on and top it uh, uh, as quickly as I could. Once you've topped it, you've knocked that weed back. It allows your red clover or your sanfoin to get away and it will take over and you'll end up with a very clean crop. The only time you'll get really get weeds then in a grass lay, if you've managed it properly, is if you poach it, either with animals or driving across it with machinery. Because once you disturb the topsoil, you've disturbed that seedbed and away it goes and you end up with a dirty field. My... Sheep Enterprise is basically run in exactly the same way both in the north and in the Cotswolds. In Staffordshire it's far easier farmed country than in the Cotswolds and in the Cotswolds we range from a very serious Cotswold brush in the north of the farm down to a very untypical blue clay in the southern end of the farm. Samfoin prefers a high pH so I tend to look for a pH of 7. Uh, to establish it, and I guess that's why a hundred years ago Samfoin was grown very successfully uh, in the Cotswolds. Now back to the breeding ewe. In our system, if I could move forward now, our business is forever evolving, the next thing that I'll do is have a low input uh, flock of sheep that are lambed outdoors. And if you've bred the right ewe, 
and you've looked for all the right traits in that sheep. So great feet, the lack of mastitis, the inability to roll on its back, um, ease of lambing and prolificacy, then you're on a very good road to success. Currently, because I don't have the dry land to stand sheep on and outwinter them, we house our sheep mid-January. So all the ewes are tupped first week in November. They then graze out and clear up um, uh, pastures until just after Christmas. Red clo uh, sorry, samphoin and grass lays. And then we'll house them mid-January. They're housed for a week and then we shear them. There's lots of interest in uh, the shearing of sheep in winter. Obviously, you need quite a nice building to put them into if the weather's inclement. We'll house about 1,500 in each building, uh, close it up quite nicely, and it really is the kindest thing you can do to a sheep if you're going to put it into a house. So we shear them. That saves on all the stress and effort of summer shearing with lambs at foot. We scan them the following week. Now, interestingly, in our organic system, I've been invited to look at other people's farms where they have run ewes um, considerably on red clover. And they'll get their ewes as fat as butter and as long and as wide as the kitchen table and then wonder why they're only getting 150% lambing percentage. When you tup sheep, you need your sheep to be on a rising plane of nutrition. You can flush your sheep uh, as much as you want, but if that sheep loses the ability to take in nutrition after she's tupped, she'll reabsorb lambs into her body. So what started off as a twin will end up as a single or even a barren ewe because of the lack of nutrition. So it's after tupping that you need to keep that nutrition going forward. So we scan them then about the third or fourth week in January. In the Cotswolds, we'll normally scan at about 195%. And in Staffordshire, it can be as high as 210. And I really don't want that to go any higher. In fact, it was one of the faults of the Slin breed a few years ago in that they were far too prolific. Very simple rule. A sheep has two teats and it's two lambs that it wants to give you success and longevity of life. Scanned. So then you listen, and I learned a very long time ago, that you can listen to lots of feed merchants telling you that you need to provide this nutrition from eight weeks out prior to lambing, and I've thrown all of that out of the window. If a ewe scans as a single in our system, it receives no supplementary feed whatsoever. Obviously, I give it a high quality forage when it's in the house, but it gets no supplementary feed at all. Twins are only fed homegrown cereal from about three weeks before lambing and triplets are probably fed a month before lambing so by scanning them we're able to put them into their various groups um, and 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 deal with their dietary needs and obviously help them out a little bit after lambing they're turned out and receive nothing and it's another good score for each particular you if you turn a sheep out a ewe out with lambs and she melts and goes to nothing, she's no use to you at all, and so she'll get blackballed. So I don't breed from her again. And I can tell you that through experience, having done it for 15 years, by selective breeding just for what you're looking for, it will provide you with what you want. We had a shepherd uh, some years ago who had a real interest in Texel sheep. Now I avoid Texels and anything of extreme breed because I want a sheep that's going to perform well from the green stuff under its feet. So the industry, the market, the supermarkets tell us that we should be producing this super lean meat of, of a beautiful confirmation and high meat to bone ratios. Actually that doesn't fit in with a sustainable farming system, it's exactly the same uh, with cattle. So we, we will look to produce from sheep that are able to perform from the green stuff under their feet. So these Texels, about 15 years ago I agreed to letting him have about 25 pedigree Texel ewes and they were bought from various sales as a foundation flock. 15 years on they are still on the farm but they are totally redundant. We do not use Texels at all. Um, in any of the breeding programs, however I keep them because they are a tremendous example of what you can achieve by selecting from animals that perform well under their own gumption. So all of the, th the uh, ram lambs are kept entire 
And from about now onwards, I will sell every ram for 600 quid apiece, and they pay for themselves very nicely. Um, and they haven't received a teaspoonful of corn or protein in their lives. It is all done on a forage-based diet. We process through the abattoir the 7,500 lambs a year. Not one teaspoonful of corn or cereal is fed to them at all. And the market is now demanding. People are becoming ever more aware about uh, meat eating and animal welfare. And if we can produce animals that are pasture fed, it is a wonderful USP for your business when selling meat. If you're arable farming now, because I think what I'm supposed to be talking about is the incorporation of sheep into stockless systems and that type of thing. You know, farming has become very, very monocultured. The fattening of sheep meat in an arable system to me is a very straightforward thing to do. You can go into a crop of wheat six weeks before harvest, blow your clover seed in or your grass seed or your kale seed, harvest your crop, a green crop will appear and you can fatten sheep from it. So you could go out and buy store lambs or you could even you can breed your own and your flock will be incorporated quite easily into your arable system. The most important point that I make here is that you put the right horse on the right course. So you go for something and you buy your foundation flock and stock from flocks that you understand the uh, health status of um, and that you buy animals that you know are going to perform once you put them uh, onto your farm. Happy? Very. Questions? Yeah. We have some questions from the floor. Brilliant. There's a raving mic. I can shout to my um, With regards to sandpoint uh, and pest, because we, we have an organic farm where we're growing salads and vegetables. And we want to now uh, bring in a rotation of livestock, so cattle, sheep. Uh, but we obviously, we do have the worry of wire worm leather jackets for the veg crop. Is there a build-up of, of soil pests with regards to sandpoint? That's a very good question, and I haven't noticed it. The only pest that, this, that we've provided for sandpoint is this overgrazing. Um, I have certainly haven't noticed any pests, and it, it does seem to be a very disease-free type of plant. Um, no, I can only say that it's been success with Samphoin and I haven't noticed any major disease Absolutely. or pest. It's also a natural anthelmintic. Um, so grazing lambs on Samphoin will provide them with the help to reduce worm burden naturally within their guts. A sheep's worst enemy is another sheep. If you don't rotate sheep properly and you get them onto dirty ground, then you can end up with serious problems with Nematodirus and Ostratagia and so on. Um, but Samphoin has remained very clean. That's the best I can answer that question for you. We did carry out as well from feed analysis. Um, there was much debate about when to mow Samphoin, and so we would take samples and analyse them at the beginning of May, mid-May and the end of May. Protein contents were certainly much higher at the beginning of May, but of course you hadn't got the bulk of crop, and so the advantage to me was the bulk of crop, and so that's why I choose to mow it at the end of May, early June. But sorry I can't be more specific on that, but I certainly haven't noticed any disease problems or, or uh, new pests on the crop, no. I look after the bees, and uh, needless to say we have a great apiary site right in the sand point, because when that flowers, it really does yield well for the honey. Um, I've got a question for the audience. I reckon this uh, marquee is, what, 23 foot tall? Anyone know how long a tap root of Sandpoint is? 23 <laughs> foot, yeah. <laughs> so, another great advantage, drought resistance. So last year we had a 1 in 40 year drought. The Sandpoint held up better than any other crop on the farm. We, I'm sure if you're livestock farmers you were getting pretty desperate too. Um, we were getting pretty anxious towards the end of last summer. I think we made 750 tonnes of hay at the end of June and I think I'd fed 400 tonnes of it by the time we got to housing stock in the autumn out in the field. But the sandfoin maintained its greenness. I won't say it ran at 100% of what it normally would have been, but it was certainly the most successful crop. And if we were to dig a hole in the field down 20 feet, you would still find hair roots from the sandfoin at that depth. 
I'm a great believer in getting crops into the ground and into those subsoils because trace elements and natural vitamins to livestock are hugely important and we feed very little. A farmer can spend a huge amount of money through uh, salesmen selling them all sorts of stuff about the need for trace elements and vitamins. Um, but if you grow a variety of crops and graze your sheep on them that are deep tap-rooted, they will draw up a huge amount of natural trace elements from subsoils and vitamins. Another question. Uh, you said it, it grows best at pH 7. Will it grow at 6.5? Yes, it would. Uh, it, yeah, no, I, but I wouldn't want to go any lower than seven and a half. So we incorporate it in May, mid-May in warm soils I found is the best. Uh, drill it at 85 kilograms per hectare. Roll it in super, super tight. So I'd almost roll it twice. And drill it at about an inch deep. And then as I said, 24 hours later, pop in and harrowcomb your, or broadcast your grass seed on at about 10 kilograms to the hectare. And that's normally just fescue and timothy grasses. And that's literally there as a weed suppressant whilst the sandfoin establishes itself. If looked after, it will give you this eight years of production. It's quite a costly seed to buy. I, one of the things that bugs me about organic farming is the cost of seed. So grass seed is phenomenally expensive. Sandfoin is phenomenally expensive. So I combine my own red clover seed and clean it myself, and I combine my own sandfoin seed. And I read and studied and talked to a few people, and they said to me, if you've got a good crop, you'll harvest about 150 kilograms an acre of sandfoin seed. And that's exactly what I did. It's a very easy crop to harvest. The, uh, the seed and the pod get right above the plant, so you just nip across with a combine, and who cares if you're throwing a bit over the back. And I got 150 kilograms of seed per acre so that's a huge saving for me red clover was the same and i think on an 80 acre plot a few years ago i filled a 14 ton trailer with red clover i then got a seed cleaning guy to come in and we stuck crisp packets over the bits of pipes and taped things up because he'd never cleaned clover seed before my father who unfortunately is no longer with us told me at the time that to only fill the combine tank one third full because the clover seed would bridge in the tank and he was exactly right uh, so we uh, rattled it about with the broom and things and got it down the auger but I filled a 14 ton trailer and from it I produced 8 tons of pure red clover seed uh, and the saving was phenomenal so it was something like 30,000 quids worth of, of seed in the trailer you had a follow up question? Yeah, you said 85 kilograms a hectare 85 kilograms a hectare we drilled there's a couple of there's a microphone at the back now that's alright don't worry about it mentioned that you establish in May would you recommend or would you advise against getting it in in the autumn right so to be completely honest with you all the research I did said drill it in warm soil in May so I've only ever done it in May so I, to, to be absolutely honest with you I've never tried it in the autumn I reckon you could but the difficult part of, of Samfoin is the establishment. I think the point I was trying to make was was that in that first year, you could think, well, this is, you know, I'm not having a lot of joy here. It's a bit disappointing. If you just keep the weeds out of it, like I said, top it, in the second year is when you see it has really established itself. And because it's this crown-grown plant, and because my business is about producing meat on a regular basis, I did push it too hard last year, and I have spoiled some of it. But that was by chewing it out. Every other crop, and ev sorry, every other year, it has been <coughs> successful right through its life. Sorry, do I have any problems growing? On drained land, or would you not entertain it? No, no, none at all, none at all. In fact, the most successful lays of samphoin that I've grown uh, have been on Cotswold brash, you know, which can dry out very quickly. So we've sort of got six inches of topsoil. It's sticky, horrible stuff with 25% stone in the top six inches. And that is where it's been very successful. I've also grown it on some loamy soil, some nicer soils in the middle of the farm very successfully i think that it, if you could grow it on soil where you could maintain a bit of moisture in the summer you know where it's likely to hold on to a bit more moisture you'd obviously have much more success than stuff that dries out completely um 
but it will sit there until that second season and get away. <laughs> no, no. Any more questions? Yeah, Chapman. Just a bit more information about your grazing strategy. When you know when are you actually grazing it? Are you rotationally grazing it? On Sandpoint. The Sandpoint. On yeah. Sandpoint. So we would take this first cut of Sandpoint around the end of May. This year, like everybody else, we've got this huge amount of grass around. I took out several insurances for myself last year and grew some whole crops, so oat and veg, to fill pits for dairy cattle. As it's turned out, I don't need it, and I could have grown pure stands of cereal. We would then take a second cut around mid-August, and that'll be about half the volume of the first cut, and we'll then be grazing it about mid to the end of September. But you literally want to just be flicking the lambs over it. But it is rocket fuel. I've never seen sheep perform so well. It's extremely palatable. And I'm told that the proteins within it break down within a ruminant stomach beautifully. And I think that's why they grew it for horses. The only real samphoin growers in the United Kingdom now would be growing it as a specialist crop to sell to delicate stomachs like rhinos and giraffes to zoos and so on. And you can see the odd load that gets sold at Newmarket for racehorses. It also makes a beautiful haylage, or hay. And again, there's no science behind this, it's just my experience. We run a very nice herd of pedigree Aberdeen Angus, and also a very nice herd of pedigree South Devons. I have pedigree sheep, Rylands and Kerry Hills, and if the show sheep and the show cattle are fed on sandfoin, it will naturally gloss them up. It's a very palatable, enjoyable feed for a ruminant stomach. Question at the back. Uh, so once you start grazing them in September of the second year, uh, are they then on at all times of year or do they come off? Not, no, because I'm looking to conserve the crop as a silage or haylage crop. I have made hay with it. The trick to making successful samphoin hay is not to use modern machinery. This is absolutely true. I've got a massive Ferguson 135 as a scraper tractor in the dairy. So I got onto the internet and on eBay I bought an Acrobat hay turner, remember those? Put it behind a 135 and turned it with that. And so it just rolled it over rather than whipped it and beat it up because you were just knocking it to bits with a, with a, with a whirly gig uh, machine. Uh, and we very successfully made Samphoin hay and it's as green as that grass there when you bale it up. Um, and again, they found it extremely palatable. So the pedigree sheep get fed on sandfoin hay if we get the season to make it. But no, you could. You could, of course you could. But you wouldn't want... You, you would be really careful about chewing the plant out and taking it down to the ground. Whereas the red clover, you could treat, treat dreadfully and it would recover. Lady at the back. Yes, absolutely. The lady just asked if you could make wrapped silage uh, from sandfoin. I have done. If you allowed it to dry out so much, that it does have quite a stalky stem on it. So you'd have to be careful about the amount of wrap that you used on your bale. Um, and I think round bales are more easily wrapped than square ones with silage. And that's just my assumption. I have wrapped it. But if you leave it to be you know, very high in dry matter, it can go quite stalky, and so you just need to watch the wrap. In fact, I do wrap bales as well of, of haylage. Any more questions? Yeah, gentlemen at the back. Um, any luck scratching it into tired lays, or is it always...? That's a very, very good question. So... On top of the land that we own and farm, I rent another 1,000 acres. Uh, some pretty poor soils on some of it, it just allows me to get a lot of stock off to leave stuff at home shut up for con the conservation of grass, samphoin, etc. There was a pretty poor lay, I bought a more drill, I got a second and more drill, the guys aren't allowed to use it, I drive that. Um, and I put my sandfoin in and I went and drove across the field really steadily and so direct drilled sandfoin into poor grass lays and I'd say I had a 50% success. So the sandfoin did appear. 
because it was only there in a small, it was there enough to notice, but it wasn't hugely successful as a dense crop. I think once we mowed it, the other thing wasn't was was when you mow it. Obviously, you don't want to mow it too low because you're having exactly the same effect as chewing it out with sheep, um, and it didn't survive particularly well. Is is the truth? So uh, yeah, success in establishing it, but it didn't hang about like the um, you know. The, the incorporated Samvoy, in, you know, as a straight crop. Uh, just a quick question. <coughs> Is it working? Yeah. Um, about your, you said you want your regular supply of lambs every month. Um, so how do you do that on your farm through the winter months, for example? Do you house them, or do you have other crops you you outwinter them on, or how does that work? Yeah, so no no, no fattening lamb is housed at all. It's all done outside and it's a 100% forage-based diet. So with the thlin, what she'll give me is, is a lamb that'll have a carcass weight of between 18 and 22 kilos at 16 weeks old, but it'll also give me a carcass of exactly the same classification at 16 months old. In Staffordshire, I will grow around 200 acres of kale. So they're just drilling that now as we speak. So the kale will go in and I will move batches of lambs from poorer quality permanent pastures onto higher quality feed in batches once a fortnight. So those lambs are going on there and I could tell you exactly what their growth rate will be and we've become rather expert at getting our lambs coming through the business in these batches. It was always our goal 15 years ago to be able to market all of the meat that we produced on the farms through our own brand, which is Dalesford Organic. We reached that goal three years ago. So <clears throat> there are several bits to this. So the 1,700 ewes that were blackballed from producing my pure thlins are now tupped with a Ryland ram. Yeah, a rare breed, minority breed ram, and this is a true story. Lady Bamford wanted to visit a country show, and so I took her to the Three Counties show, and we, she took a rather a liking to these Ryland sheep, and so as she looked at them and started smiling, I said, come on, let's go and have a look at the cattle. And um, she said, no, no, I rather like these. They don't, they don't bother me at all with agriculture, but she insisted I have some of these Rylands. And just as an experiment, a couple of years later, we now have a very nice flock of Rylands, uh, I put a few over Thlin News, and the lambs produced were phenomenal. I mean, really, really pleasing. It's a hidden secret. I would advise anybody using a Ryland ram over a commercial ewe. And so those 1,700 go to Ryland, those lambs would always fatten that little bit earlier, so they will be the very first lambs to come into the business mid-August. And now, to fill the order 52 weeks of the year, I employ the services of my organic neighbour who lambs earlier in February, and he will supply, start supplying me lamb, with lambs from mid-June. I take hoggets right through to mid-June. He he, he'll then supply me with lambs for eight weeks right up until I start supplying from our own farms and the other way I do it is it's very hard to find and again I'm being completely truthful with you if I went out and said you know I'd like to buy organic lambs from people to come into my business and, and I knew that they had been raised to a certain standard it would be virtually impossible for me to find that number of lambs of the quality that I want Having spent quite a lot of time in the north of England on the borders many years ago, I know quite a lot of farmers up there that are organic on their hill farms. When they wean their lambs, their lambs are sold and they lose their organic status in a standard market going to the store trade. So I now have several farmers that I visit at the end of August and I will buy 3,000 store lambs, usually chiviots. They come down onto some pretty poor tucker and then after Christmas I start moving them onto this sandfoin um, and kale and they come into the business right up until mid-June. Um, it's a real headache for me because I'm talking about 150 a week and we're about to go to 200 a week and I want to get to 300 a week. That's 15,000 lambs a year and I think that represents about 35 to 40 percent of the market. So anybody got any organic lambs of a quite high quality come and talk to me. And on that note, <laughs> we've actually uh, run on there. a little bit. Sorry, do you tell you 
Ah, uh, very good. Another very good question. I do in Staffordshire. I don't in the Cotswolds, but it's something that we will do, and it's something I'd be quite confident to do because of the selective breeding program over so many years. Um, lots and lots of interest now from lots and lots of farms about incorporating sheep into their arable systems, and they are desperate for well-bred, thin ewe lambs. I. I, it would be more profitable for me to sell the second cut ewe lambs to other farmers that probably wouldn't be big enough for tupping, but our biggest ones are certainly big enough for tupping and we'd expect 150% lambing off them. Richard, thank you very much.